Welcome everyone. It's Nate Erskine Smith here, and I'm joined by newly elected MPP for Connecticut Carlton, Karen McGrown. And we're here to talk about healthcare. But before we talk about healthcare, I want to talk about team building and the importance of team. So I'm running for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party, but I am only going to be successful if we build the strongest team that we can to deliver for the province of Ontario. And here we have the newest member of our team. And Karen, newly elected MPP, do you want to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Nate. I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is to be here with you today. And uh, I think it's so important to have a leader that's going to be able to connect with the greatest number of people that has experience actually building support right from the grassroots. I know you can do that. And that's why you're the right person at the right time to be the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. This is what we need, that grassroots effort. I know you can work across the aisle. I've seen you do it. I know you can you can make a difference. I know you bring people in and uh, they respect you. And so do I. And your commitment to integrity, you say what you mean, you mean what you say, and then you do what you say you're going to do. And that's exactly what we need right now in politics in Ontario. Well, you mentioned integrity. And I think integrity is Doug Ford's greatest weakness. And if we build this team in the right way, it should be and will be our greatest strength. And you and I, we worked together in federal parliament for a number of years, and it was that core value of integrity that I think we shared the most. I think so. I totally agree. So we, we talk about integrity in politics and integrity in politics, not only on the Green Belt, but in healthcare. But we also want to talk about a, a big announcement today. We've launched housing plans. We've launched ambitious climate plans. Today, we're talking about ambitious healthcare policy. And before getting to the details, Karen, you made a move from federal politics to provincial politics now. Mm -hmm. How much of the motivation behind that move was healthcare? I, I would say it was the majority, and it was the a combination of the integrity issue and healthcare. I talked to so many people who didn't have family doctors, so many people that weren't getting the kind of support they needed from the healthcare system. And I thought, and I watched what was going on, I'm thinking, I see them privatizing the little pieces of our healthcare system, bit by bit by bit, hoping that no one will notice. Well, I noticed. And I said, I, I just can't stand by and allow this to continue and not try to step in and stop it. So I think the healthcare was my number one issue, was the number one issue in the by-election when I was knocking on doors. And it's my number one issue too. So I was really pleased to be part of this and to, to help develop a really strong platform policy proposal about how we're going to deal with healthcare. I want to thank Karen for contributing to the healthcare policies. Also, I'd be remiss, we had a, a wicked team of people who sometimes giving private advice, sometimes being more publicly with us, and especially Catherine Nowers, she's the former director of policy for the federal health minister, and she's now got a role at the CFIA, but hugely helpful in bringing the healthcare policy team together and delivering a really ambitious set of policies, which you can find at meetnate.ca slash health. And you can also find on our website, our housing and climate policies. When we talk about healthcare policies, really we're talking about five big categories. One is we have a health human resource crisis across Ontario, lack of doctors, lack of nurses, lack of PSWs. We need to, in, in, in all ways, really prioritize addressing the health human resource crisis. So fairer wages, of course, but better working conditions at the same time. And a level of seriousness in attracting healthcare workforce to, to deliver in all regions. The second piece is, and you mentioned the lack of access to family doctors, 2.2 million people in Ontario don't have access to a family health team and a family doctor. It is a crisis that's impacting our, our emergency rooms, and that needs to be an absolute priority, family health teams for everyone. Third, we've got a mental health and addictions crisis that is, that is on the ground happening in every community, small yes. and large. Yes. And I've heard from people in Sioux Lookout, I've heard from people in Windsor and everywhere in between that we need provincial leadership to deliver better mental health services and to deliver better harm reduction and treatment services to give people the supports they need to save lives in the opioid crisis. Fourth, it's incredibly important that everyone is able to age in dignity. And so, we have a government right now that is bragging about the number of beds they're building in large institutional care centers. Nobody wants to live in. And we are underinvesting in home and community care 
and allowing our seniors to age in dignity. And lastly, and I'm, we're, we're, we're going to answer any questions. We'll answer healthcare questions. We'll answer other questions as well for anyone posting on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, and, and everywhere else. Uh, but the fifth piece is a strong public health approach. And, and we learned in the pandemic the need for a strong public health approach, but it's really about also focusing on preventative health care, healthy living, active living, healthy eating, and the social determinants of health and investing in poverty reduction, stronger social assistance, and housing. As I say, we've delivered ambitious housing plans. We do need the government to be back in the game in non-market housing in a serious way. And with that, uh, do you want to comment on, you know, those are the five pillars, and it's a detailed, I think it's six or seven pages of detailed policy that we put out. Always welcome and open to new ideas as well, if there are things that you think should be in there that aren't in there. Uh, do you have anything to add about those priorities or healthcare, the need for seriousness and, 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 and confidence in managing our healthcare system? And like we've talked all along, it really, the patient should be at the center of all of this. Exactly. And we cannot put the patient at the center of it if we don't have healthcare workers, which are the foundation of our whole healthcare system. If they're not being treated, if they're not being supported, if they're not being resourced, if they're not being res uh, treated with respect, and, and that's what's happening right now. So that's why it, the healthcare workers are so important because they're the ones who are gonna put the patients first. And that's that's exactly the focus we need. And we did a we did an event together last night in Carlton, and there's an individual who showed up, Leonard, who can't wow. find a family doctor. He's spending out of pocket significant sums now because he can't find a family doctor. And he's one of you know millions of people across the province of Ontario. And there are many different answers to that challenge. But one is making sure that you've got respect and support for healthcare professionals. One is making sure we look at wages and working conditions, making sure that people aren't leaving family health. But, you know, they might they might do their residency, but then they I, I've heard stories of people leaving and going to become specialists, not only because of pay, but because they also don't want the administrative headache of managing that kind of a practice. Uh, we also, though, meet too many people in, in our jobs where we meet people who are doctors back home, they yes, come to Canada, yes. and they can't get a residency here. They they can't get a space here, and they can't practice here, and they end up doing something that is benefiting our economy, whether it is driving an Uber, whether it is working as a security guard, but they aren't delivering the the, the benefit that they could be delivering for their families, for themselves, but also for us. Absolutely. They, they're not living up to the potential of, of themselves and their families and uh, their contributions here in Ontario. And, and there are barriers in place. Those barriers need to be removed. They need, they need to be pushed aside. Now, I, I listened in, joined the Canadian Medical Association uh, Healthcare Summit in Ottawa last week, yeah. and I heard the president of the CMA, uh, Dr. Kathleen Ross, call the challenges facing healthcare right now a wicked problem. Yes. And it is a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem because it's so complex, and there's so many different jurisdictions, so many different facets to the problem, and it, it's, a, it's complicated. If you push on one area, you'll actually have unintended consequences somewhere else. So what we need is this approach where it's a continuous improvement. And we pick a few things and we fix that, see how that's working. And it's a commitment to being on top of this all the time, never giving up and never accepting that it's finished. It won't ever be finished. Yeah. We just got to keep on improving it step by step. And learning from other jurisdictions at the same time. and. You know, I've talked a lot about Portugal and the need to learn from Portugal and other models when it comes to treating substance use as a health issue and saving lives. But interestingly, I had uh, Dr. Bob Bell on my podcast many months ago now, and we were talking about the UK model for mental health. And they cover up to 12 hours of talk therapy, and they've seen incredible improvements when it comes to anxiety and depression just by delivering that expansion of mental health services for those in need. And we made the same commitment in the course of our set of proposals. And you're right, it's, it's got to be iterative. It's got to be a continuous learning approach. And it's got to be looking at all of the practices across different countries and jurisdictions and saying, what works best? Right. And how do we learn from what works best and bring it here? Exactly. Why not? Other people have gone through it. And they've, we've seen what success looks like, what failure looks like. So let's use that information. You know, learn from the mistakes of others and actually come up with better proposals for here at home. Exactly. So I'm joined here by Karen McCrimmon, 
uh, the newest member of our team. I like to think we're running on a bit of a ticket here. The idea <laughs> is that, you know, we, I know we don't have tickets in, you know, provincial liberal leadership contests exactly. We don't have tickets in Canadian politics in quite the same way. But I've always thought there's so much emphasis on the leader. And it's important you've got emphasis on the leader. But it truly should be about building the strongest team for all of Ontario. And there's no way one person, I like to think I've got a handle on many issues and I, you know, I, I consult with experts, I learn from experts and I like to think of my advocacy, I, I have a certain breadth of knowledge on different topics, but there's no way you can be expert in everything and handle everything all at once, given the wicked problems in healthcare and, and in other settings that we face. And so the idea of building this together and running the province together, we're going to be very successful if we do this together. I, I couldn't agree more. You need a team. And if I know you're the kind of person that can build that team, bring those people in because they have confidence in you. You have earned people's trust. That's the number one issue when it comes to leadership. After 31 years in the military, I've seen leaders, leaders that succeeded and did not. But it comes down to trust. And that's where the integrity piece comes so important. People trust in you. They trust in your integrity. They know the, that you're going to follow through. That'll make all the difference. To me. And we're here answering questions. We'll answer any question. I was saying to, to Karen earlier, at the beginning of the pandemic, we started doing Facebook Lives and Q&As for about 45 minutes to an hour every Thursday night, our Thursday Night Lives. And this is a Friday morning live, I suppose, but our Thursday Night Lives. And uh, we would answer, I'd answer any question. And we did it for over a year. So we did you know, every week for over a year. And so you can answer, you can ask questions on healthcare, but you can ask any question you like, whether you're joining us on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Now, the first question we got is related to the social determinants of health, but it is specific really to the, emer the disability benefit system. And the questions around a disability emergency relief benefit, will I join MPs in asking to implement the disability emergency relief benefit? And I'll say I've joined Senators, I've joined Mike Morris and the Green Party, I've joined my liberal colleagues to really push for widely expanding and really delivering the uh, disability, the Canada disability benefit on a much faster timeline. I was co-chair of the All-Party anti poverty Caucus. I stepped down because of running the liberal leadership, but in co-chairing that really pushed for basic income supports, including a really, a really expansive disability benefit. So it's incredibly important that at the federal level, we see that kind of leadership. And in the last budget cycle, I was pushing in this coming fall economic statement, I'll be pushing. And so we absolutely need relief in as immediate term way as we possibly can. The, the second thing to say is, and because we're joined here to talk provincial politics, there's a huge opportunity at the provincial level absolutely. to strengthen disability assistance in Ontario. And there's been the problem in the past where the federal government has stepped up and tried to make things better, but the province didn't. Actually, problems sometimes went backwards. So we need the, the, both the federal level and the provincial level to be in step with this. Exactly. And so, and if if you know, I know that <laughs> this is something that has mattered to you all those years. We worked worked together on this issue when we were in the House of Commons. And so, I know that we'll be bringing it to the provincial level because people deserve better. And we've got, uh, I should say, we got six policy tables in the course of building out these ideas. If we are going to commit to serious leadership in this race, which we are, then we have to act with that level of seriousness in delivering ideas. And so we have a policy table on housing. We've released a set of ideas. Policy table on climate and environment. We've released a set of ideas. I was joined by Catherine McKenna not so long ago. Obviously a serious team on healthcare, and that's what we're mostly talking about today. And we also have policy tables around education, which is gonna come next week and around social safety net reform and around economy. And when you look at social safety net reform, this is going to be where we really lean into a conversation around strengthening social assistance, making sure we build a social safety net that leaves nobody behind, and especially people with disabilities. Okay, we have a question. What sets our healthcare policies apart from other candidates? And I would begin by saying other candidates have brought to the fore really great ideas as well. So. Dr. Shamji is an amazing, active liberal MPP who has the health critic role and former emergency room doc at my local hospital, Michael Barron Hospital. And he has focused on one of the challenges we're, we're focused on today, which is access to family health teams and family doctors and making sure we're delivering greater primary care. 
So I would like to thank, we work hand in hand with Dr. Shamji after this leadership race. We're yes. you know, collaborative even in this leadership race. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll work together on those core challenges that we share. Uh, where uh, Yasser Nafi has also talked about mental health as it relates to talk therapy and expanding structured therapy. And, and we're committing to something very similar in that regard based on the UK model. I would say we're going further on the mental health side and talking about mental health and addictions specifically, talking about treating substance use as a health issue to save lives. Police chiefs say it. Yes. Medical experts say it. Families who have lost loved ones say it. We need to follow the evidence to save lives. And we're also focusing more on a, on a public health approach. And I think we're, I, I haven't seen other candidates. I expect other candidates will, but we're, we're really zeroing in on aging with dignity and the need to invest in home and community care. Um, and I, the only thing I would emphasize, and I, I, Karen, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are having watched this. It, the level of detail is there. I, I know Dr. Shamji's put a level of detail in. Uh, Ted Shu has a level of detail in his housing and, and, and environment plans. I haven't seen him release healthcare, but I know he will. But that level of seriousness and detail. This is a, a, a very detailed policy document. Why? Because we had an incredible group of experts that contributed to this. And again, if, if you think something's missing, if you think something should be adjusted, this is a matter of building this together. So please be in touch and let us know and, and we can continue to add and, and strengthen this plan. But I think what, what sets us apart is that level of seriousness and comprehensiveness. Uh, and I think so. And the fact, uh, the level of collaboration. Yeah. And good. so inviting people in, that's how we're gonna, you know, you can't deal with this kind of a wicked problem unless you bring in the experts. Bring in the people who have real life experience solving these problems. And I, I've seen the depth to which you have invited that input into the production of this of this uh, policy framework. And it is just a framework. Exactly. It's a place to start a discussion. Exactly. And we'll just continue to build it from here. But at least we have a place to start from. Exactly. That's the most important thing. Yeah, completely agree. And it it is, you know, in politics, you know this. Sometimes there's this idea of you get there, you're there to make this big difference, you're there to speak your mind on behalf of your community, and then the policies are written elsewhere, and you're told to go out and basically be a spokesperson for policies that you didn't have a hand in. And I would like to do things very differently. Yes. And, and it, it ought to be, uh, you know, bring experts in, bring patients in and people with experience, and then bring the representatives and the team that you're building in and say, what is missing in, in your communities? What do we need to deliver on? And it's incredibly important that it's not just sitting members of provincial parliament. We, don't, we have nine. You're one of the nine. That's great. But we also need to make sure that there are voices in, you know, you're actually a good example. You represent a community that is that isn't as urban as others. Mm -hmm. But we we do need that perspective at the table on suburban, rural, and northern perspectives that you need every region of the province to be feeding into and every corner of the province to be feeding into our plans. And that's and that's exactly why this approach will work because we're inviting people from all the different regions of the province. Come on, tell us what the issues are. Yeah. What's the number one issue that you're facing right now? And we're gonna make sure that that's dealt with. So I think that's um, when you're developing this kind of thing, if you're of the nature, I know you, I know how you work. I know that people feel comfortable coming and talking to you and sitting down and explaining the issues. And then you get it right away. And then you have a way of being able to explain it to others. That's the key. Yeah. It's it's good taking it all in, but can you explain it to others and get them on board as well? That's what you do. And uh, to that end, it's funny that I, I was thinking as you're talking about a conversation in Sioux Lookout, there's a, a woman there who... I met her on the beach as we were giving out freezies to, to kids this past summer. And she had struggled with uh, an addiction issue early in the pandemic. And she ended up having to go to Milton to get a treatment service. And she's recovered now uh, as much as one can be. And, and that's great. And, and, you know, she was there with her kid and, and she's happy as anything. But she was describing a situation where it's unfair and impossible for some people if they don't have treatment closer to home in their communities. And we do need to make sure that there are some particular challenges in certain communities, sure. access to treatment, access to primary care and access everywhere, but especially mm -hmm. acute in rural and northern communities. And how do we have a special attention to some of those acute issues? Okay, so we've got a few other questions here. Uh, we have, this is for you. Uh, there are a number of strong candidates running for the Ontario Liberal leadership. 
So why are you choosing to support me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, listen, Nate and I worked together for almost six years in the House of Commons, and we were very like-minded, very um, committed. And, and Nate believes that politics should be about serving people, should be about serving your community. That's what I believe. He also believes that politics should be about making people's lives better. And that's why I want to be in politics. I want to help make people's lives better. So we've always been well aligned that way. And that that's what politics should be. And then I like the way that, that you do business. I like the way that you work with people, that you value. I see that. I see you valuing people time and time and time again, giving, giving them your time and your attention. And uh, I, I have this feeling that that's, that's how you're going to do politics here and provincially as well. And I think that's exactly what we need. We need people involved in politics who want to do better for people. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because there are frustrations to politics. There are major faults to politics. We've been in politics long enough. You know, you see them, you know, in real time, these frustrations, but everyone feels it. There's a certain cynicism. Uh, you know, politicians, my, my uncle Charlie, he's passed now, uh, but in Windsor, he's more conservative. When I went from a lot of politics, he was like, oh, step up, step down, lateral move. And, you know, there's just sort of a, a cynicism in, in yes. politics sometimes. But for all of that, it's still the most important way to make a difference in the lives of those around us. Absolutely. And I think it was Paul Martin who said that that he could have an impact on more people's lives, make their lives better in one day at, at being a politician than any other. And yeah. I think it's exactly true. And that's why we need people that are in it for people. Yeah. Not not profits. Not yeah. like what we're seeing that's happening in Ontario right now. Oh yeah, in it for their friends. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. They're in it for their friends instead of being in it for other people. And feeding yeah. the cynicism. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 We've we've break we you talked about trust that you have said, and we break that trust when yes. we don't act with integrity. Uh well, where are we gonna go? Okay, so this is from YouTube. What do you think about increasing family doctor residencies? Will you allow foreign credentials to work in Ontario? So if you look in our plan, absolutely, we are committed to expediting the recognition of foreign credentials. It is essential that not only we recognize those credentials, but we create residencies. I am tired of speaking to people who say, I was a doctor back home, I came here, and I'm finished my examinations. I've done the, the credential recognition. I can't find a residency. And if I can't find a residency within the year, I'm going to go to the United States, and we're going to lose that individual yes. forever. So we have people who want to be here. We have a crisis in lack of access to primary care and family health teams and family doctors, and yet we are not delivering the level of serious ambition on a timeline, accelerating that timeline that, that, that is going to deliver for people. And so we, we absolutely need to make sure that we're expanding the number of people who are graduating in these yeah, spaces, absolutely. but we also need to expand the number of residencies and, and especially for foreign, foreign doctors as well. Yeah, I knocked on the door and I talked to a doctor that, it, there's additional requirements. So if a, a Canadian goes and gets screened in the United States and starts practicing in the United States, he can go down there and practice with just his license. If he wants to come back and serve uh, to Canada, he needs to be board certified. Yeah. That's another layer of paperwork, another layer of bureaucracy that we don't need. So let's let's strip out the stuff we don't need and actually you know, serve the people of Ontario better by increasing the number of family docs we need. Especially when the the challenge is so great. This isn't, you know, 100,000 people are struggling with access oh. to a family doctor in different parts of the province. And so, you know, we're, we're moving steadily and we're going to address that problem. This is 2.2 million people out, out of a province of 14.5 million people. This is an incredibly huge challenge in most people's lives. And you hear it, we, uh, we were mentioning Leonard earlier, you know, he's got to be in it mm -hmm. around 40. You've got, there's a Sherry, uh, she's got to be in her 60s or around 70. She was talking about not having access to a family doctor. This is touching so many different demographics. It's touching low income people, especially in large urban centers. Mm -hmm. It's touching people of all associate demographics in large urban, or sorry, uh, rural and, and remote communities. But it, we, we just don't see the level of ambition no. and action that we need to see to meet the scale of the challenge. And, and it has always, it's been a challenge for quite a while, 
But, but what's happening now is then that challenge has been allowed to become a crisis, yeah, exactly. right? And then and exactly. we could have reined this in, things that could have been done five years ago that we wouldn't be in the position with 2.2 million people without a family doctor. And it needed to be started five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, but the, the, the action isn't there. There's nothing being done that's actually going to resolve this crisis, either in the short term or the long term. Exactly. We have a question, what role do you see for private healthcare providers? And we do have for-profit delivery already in our system, but we should be very careful about any expansion. And, and frankly, the expansion and the innovation and the efficiency that we should see should be in the nonprofit system. And you know, you've got experts who say, and, and David Naylor is one of them, who will point to the United States and say, there are many lessons to learn in the United States, but it's in the nonprofit HMOs that deliver more efficient care, more innovative care, but in the nonprofit system. And what I really worry about and you shared some of these concerns already, but you've got a situation now in the wake of the Auditor General's report on the Green Bill. We know this government is in it for their friends. Yes. Friends helping friends. And you've got a situation now as they expand for-profit surgery clinics, not recommended by the Ontario, uh, you know, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, not recommended by the Ontario Medical Association. I, I'm, I'm not sure if they had anyone really recommending the expansion of for-profit surgery clinics at all instead of nonprofit surgery clinics, community care clinics. Uh, but you've got a situation where it, it, it's likely to be the Wild West and it's going to be friends helping friends. friends. Well, we've seen that already in long-term care. Yeah. And if that's the thing about being liberal. Like it's being in the center. It's being in the core. It's being able to make decisions based on data and science and evidence. The, the data and the evidence is there as senior citizens, they age healthier and better. They're happier in their own home, in their own community. And and uh, it actually is cheaper. Well, so why wouldn't you do something that makes senior citizens happy when it actually saves your money? But why? Because nobody profits. Exactly. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing profit taking. And so this is the Ford government helping out its friends. And it wants to do that with the green belt. It wants to do that with healthcare too. And we need to stand up to that. And, and I will say, you know, when, Premier Ford stands at a microphone and says, the status quo in healthcare isn't working. And all of us feel it because, you know, you mentioned it's gone from a challenge to a crisis. You've got millions of people that don't have access to a family health team. You've got people waiting with their kids in the emergency room for over seven, eight hours and great frustrations. You've got people who are, you know, I think it's 13% of the beds in the hospital care system are taken up by people who shouldn't be in the hospital system at all and need an alternate level of care. And so there's real frustrations in the healthcare system and the status quo isn't working in many ways. But the pivot from there to therefore we need to expand for-profit surgery clinics is not justified on the evidence. And already, you know, the Auditor General and other reports has said there are concerns about upselling, upselling in the for-profit system we already have. So we as liberals ought to defend equity in the system and we will defend equity in the system. Wealth should not allow you to jump the queue. And we will yes. defend equity. There's no question about it. But we will also defend efficiency and innovation to improve the system as best we can. But we're going to deliver that efficiency and innovation in a nonprofit system. That's right. And, and it's been proven time and time again. That's where we want to be. We've got a, another question. Megan Ann writes, hi, Nate and Karen. How will you strengthen and protect access to trans health care and rights in Ontario? So this is not a... In, you know, a set of detailed kind of proposals that are in our that are in our healthcare policy document right now. So, if you have specific concrete ideas in the healthcare space, I would welcome them. You know, and I will I will say at, at a at a high level, this is about making sure that everyone in our society has access to the healthcare system that is treated with dignity, with respect, and 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 that we have that core value of equality that that runs through our healthcare system. And so anyone who of any sexual orientation, any, any, you know, any, any racial background, but especially, you know, you look at what's going on in the United States right now, it's, and a real worry of the attack on people uh, who identify as trans. And, you know, it is incredibly important that we protect their human rights. And so from that perspective, in any policy, there's got to be that human rights lens. I have, and, uh, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. I, you know, I'll just tell a personal anecdote. And one of my mentors-in-law 
is Angela Swan. When I first met her, she was transitioning to be Angela Swan, you know, spent most of her life as John Swan and is a member of the Order of Canada, one of the smartest lawyers I've ever met in my life. And she has, she delivers a message of expecting acceptance, that you go through life and you don't always receive it, but if you expect acceptance, you're more likely to receive it. Now, it's a very important message for her to deliver, and I think it's a very positive message to deliver, but it's incredibly important that we go further than just expecting acceptance. As governments, we have to ensure that they ensure acceptance. That's exactly right. And human rights, I think, is key. And these are all human rights. And, and the idea that we all have to fit in one little box is that we have to be all the same. That, that's just wrong. I, I think that human beings deserve that freedom to be who they are. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't like it when I see a, a group of people that are singled out for attacks, for bigotry. And I think we have to stand up. That's that's our job is to stand up for these for people and to preserve that to protect their human rights and not allow that kind of bigotry and hate to take over in our country. And if you listening, uh, Megan, if you have specific su suggestions on how to realize that broad commitment that Karen and I both share into something more concrete in in the healthcare system, I would certainly welcome it. And as I say, the idea is to encourage more ideas and, and, and to expand what we've proposed here. Will writes, do you think it's time to build another medical school in Ontario to increase the supply of doctors? I'm not sure the answer to that question. And I would I would want to depend upon you know experts who have thought through this question in a more serious way. I will say we do need to expand the number of spaces in medical schools. And if the existing number of medical schools can't supply those spaces, then maybe it is a conversation we should be having. And, and let's have that conversation. But the core challenge at, at the outset has to be, how do we create more graduating, how do we create more spaces to graduate more doctors? Uh, for promise to invest in long-term care, what would you do differently? What do you think about long-term care as it is in Ontario right now? Oh, it's, it, it, it is a tragedy. It really and truly is. And you saw through COVID how it, you compared for-profit care and not-for-profit care. It, it's really a disgrace. Listen, we, the, the evidence is all out there. Like I mentioned before, seniors do better when they're at home, when they're in their home community, when they're looked after, and instead of in some institution somewhere. So, and it saves you money. So why not go that way? So produce more home care, produce more community care, make sure, and as, as people age, it's really easy to become isolated. We don't want that to happen. Yeah. We want them to remain very vital, connected members of the community and will keep them healthy longer. And it's interesting when you look at what other countries do, we talked about learning from other countries yes. and uh, Samir Sinha joined me at one point for a conversation on my podcast and he, and he mentioned Denmark a number of times. And I'm like, okay, well, what, what does Denmark do in a, in a better way? And I had the Library of Parliament do some research and they do spend more as a percentage of GDP on senior care. So they spend more money, that's, that's part of the picture. But the other part is how they spend that money. And two thirds of every dollar that we spend here is spent on large institutional care. Two thirds of every dollar they spend in Denmark is on home and community <laughs> care. And so how we spend really does matter. And we've got to make sure we're investing in better home and community care. My mom uh, renovated her, this is, I think five years ago now, renovated her basement. So my now 95 year old grandmother could move in from Grimsby and it's a one bedroom apartment down there. and it works. And my mom is the caregiver. It's exhausting and stressful yes. and, and, and all of those things as any caregiver knows. We also need, um, a, we need to fix the care coordination system so that individuals who are delivering care and are the, the primary caregivers for their loved ones, and they're saving the system money and, and delivering better care, of course, because of those, those loving relationships. We need to make sure that they are supported and that there's a single window that they can go to to say, Here's my situation. Here's the caregiving that I am providing. What supports can I provide? Whether it's a, a day a week, a PSW comes in, someone that provides some cleaning services, someone that provides some cooking services. How do I, I don't need everything, mm -hmm. but I could use a little bit of support here and there. And that, that system is not functioning adequately here in Ontario. And we aren't delivering support for caregivers. 
that we need to that we need to deliver. And uh, we saw that completely in the military as well. It's the family caregivers that are making the biggest contributions, you know, and and we're, we weren't supporting them. This that needs to get better everywhere. The recognition, the difference that caregivers make in people's lives. They need to be better supported, and I'm, that's certainly something that I've championed by holding. And the, the last thing I say, we talked about home and community care, we talked about supporting caregivers. Those have to be essential priorities. Uh, the other piece really has to be about, you know, where long-term care is the only option. And it, it is sometimes the only option. We have to make sure, and I mean, we can talk about the lessons learned in the pandemic. If you listen to experts, society realized the challenges of long-term care during the pandemic. But these challenges pre-existed the pandemic, and we really do need to make sure we do, you know, you, you talk about emphasizing and prioritizing nonprofit care. That's important. And we also need to make sure that we implement the long-term care standards Seniors that have now been standards. that have now been proposed. Yes. Okay, so we have a question. Mental health is a serious concern for young Ontarians. What will your plan do to support? So first, we've really emphasized the access to structured talk therapy and expanding. Expanding that conversation, mental health is health. And for too long, we've separated these conversations of yes. mental health and physical health, but they're fundamentally linked and we do make sure we, we do better by mental health for everyone. Now, for young people in particular, we we need to make sure that in schools and in, in services connected to post-secondary institutions, we need to make sure that there are mental health supports to support students where they are and to make it as easily to act as easy to access as possible for young people. Yes, and you know, with and it has to be so that people feel comfortable going there. We have to get rid of that kind of stigma. Yes, it has to become a part of our everyday life. Just like we talk about what we eat and how we exercise, or don't. What are we doing to take care of our mental health? And so many things that that actually help people. We need to encourage. So uh, if they have access to that kind of professional care, if they need it, but also learn how, how do you look after your own mental health? And there are certain things like um, mental health first aid. Yeah. So why not make that kind of a course available to, to everyone? So they understand, you know, if, if, they're if they're challenged with something in their life, they have somewhere to go. And then they go, okay, there's something here I need to deal with. And then we're, we're there with the help when they need it. The, the next question is not entirely related, but there is a connection, and it's uh, with a uh, profit-oriented food supply chain, how will you implement preventative care? Now, well, I want to talk about food and, and healthy eating, but there is also, when we talk about youth mental health, there's a huge preventative element to getting to people at a younger age who are struggling with mental health challenges and making sure the supports are there. And there's a huge, you know, we know that the impact will be long-term, instead of allowing those challenges to get worse and worse and worse without supports. Yes. And, and, and then ultimately, the healthcare system has to really respond in a, in a reactive way and a much costlier way. Now, when it comes to food and, 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 and healthier food, we federally, and I've been a big part of pushing this, you're, you're, you'll remember this, we promised too many times, we haven't delivered on the dollars yet, a national school food policy and a healthy school food policy. Now, provinces are best placed to deliver on this. We, you know, we see states in the United States that deliver universal school food policies. Well, in Ontario, we should have a universal, healthy school food policy. We should also have healthy food, quality, healthy food in our long-term care yeah. and in our hospitals, hospitals and in our publicly regulated, provincially regulated institutions. But if we take preventative health care seriously, it's got to be about active living and it's got to be about healthy eating. And we have a food guide that we need to operationalize at the provincial level to really make that kind of preventative health care a reality and, and habit forming reality. Uh, it, it's, it's obviously improving individuals' lives, but it will also save the system a ton down the road. Yes, exactly. And even just teaching, again, start with children. Teach them, you know, the food guide. T teach them how to do some basic um, cooking when, especially using things that we know are good for us. We're, we're just not in the habit of eating them as much, maybe lentils and, and beans and fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. How do we get them into people's, uh, to be a daily part of people's uh, diet? So that education can start and the province is responsible for education, exactly. so why not? And we know the 
one of the greatest challenges to the healthcare system is the management of chronic diseases. And we could deliver much more serious preventative care that would address those chronic diseases. It would save money in the system if we delivered that kind of those initiatives around healthy eating and active living and, and making sure that those are habits that we live through, you know, we we adopt and we, and we live with for, for, for our lives. Now, well, we're going to close with this question, I think. So I want to thank everyone for, for joining us. It is talking a little bit about perspective on leadership, but more importantly, let's drill down a little bit on the question is, how will you and I work together to rebuild the party? And you're a newly elected MPP. What, I've got my own thoughts. I've been delivering speeches on the road over 110 ridings now out of 124 about how I think we ought to rebuild the party. What do you see as the priorities you're coming into office with, you're getting sworn in next week? How do we rebuild this party so we rebuild our province? But I, I think the, the key is leadership, me. The, yeah. the key is teamwork. And the key is having everyone recognized for their contribution, what they can bring to the table. My favorite definition of leadership is from John Quincy Adams. Yes, I know he's American, but he's actually, he's got some good words. It is that if by your actions, by what you do, you inspire, that's what leaders do, they inspire. You inspire others to dream more, to hope more, to learn more, to do more and become more than you are a leader. Nate, it's the kind of it's the kind of leadership you practice every day. It's the kind of leadership I try to practice every day. People will believe that we're we're in it for them. They know we're in it. The people of my community know I'm in it for them. The people in your community know that you're in it for them. Yeah. So together we'll be in it for all of Ontario. That's, it doesn't change that much. The structure, the foundation of that service, that leadership service, remains the same. I am going to be much less articulate than John Quincy Adams in answering this question, uh, but I, I love that answer. Uh, and I would say, you know, on the road, what I've been saying, and I'll say it a million more times, but it's really about three things. It's about making sure that we deliver on our values. And we've talked about integrity. I, I think, as I say, it's Doug Ford's greatest weakness. It is going to be our greatest strength. And we have to build that trust in what we do and in the possibility of politics. And we only do that by acting with integrity. But it's also about seriousness and confidence mm -hmm. in managing the healthcare system, and building housing, being a party that is going to build things again. It's about fairness and compassion for those in need. We talk about yeah. the social determinants of health. We talk about mental health and addictions. We, we can't see these values to other parties. We can't just be the not Doug Ford party. There are three in the province of Ontario. We've got to make sure we embody these values in a really serious way and deliver that kind of serious leadership. And it's about values. It's also about ideas. And so we're talking about specific policy prescriptions to address challenges that exist in every corner of the province on housing, on healthcare, on the climate and environment, education we'll be talking about next week. And, and we need real seriousness in delivery on those ideas. And then it is about that kind of hard work and team building. We gotta show up into communities, rebuild an active presence. And it's it's about leadership, but it's not leadership of one person, okay? I am I hope to be the leader. I'm working relentlessly hard to build a team of people all across this province to rebuild our party and rebuild our province. But I will tell you, it isn't just about me. Leadership is going to come from every single member of the team that we build and that we build together. And Karen is an essential member of that team. We are going to build this together. And I hope many of you will come and build this with us. And a shameless plug at the end, I have to. You have until September 11th to join the Ontario Liberal Party to become a member. It is free. Anyone 14 years old, any resident, not even citizen, can, can become a member. But you have to do it by September 11th to vote in this leadership race. And we have an opportunity to shape our party, to shape our politics, and to shape our province that rarely comes along. And so please join. If you want better, we want better. And if you want better, the answer is participation. And, and really deliver a message to all of your friends and family. For all of its faults, politics is the most important way we make a difference in the lives of those around us. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining us this morning. Thanks.